All right, chapter 15 of Reasons and Persons. Uh, chapter 14 was talking about rationality. Now we're talking about personal identity and morality. Uh, and to introduce this, a few words about utilitarianism. Parfit is defending a consequentialist theory which looks a look, lot like utilitarianism. Consequentialism, if you remember, says that what makes an action or a policy, right or wrong, depends on the consequences that it brings about. So did I do the right thing? Well, it depends whether or not you brought about a good result or a good consequence, hence consequentialism. Utilitarianism is a consequentialist theory that says the measure of whether or not something is a good outcome is in terms of benefit or welfare or happiness or pleasure. All of these things sort of overlap. Uh, the guy who more or less started the modern version of utilitarianism, Jeremy Bentham, says we should maximize pleasure. Okay, so uh, the right action is one that maximizes pleasure for everyone affected by that action. Uh, and you know, that doesn't mean necessarily makes everybody happy because maybe there are only bad options, in which case utilitarianism says minimize pain. You maximize the balance of pleasure over pa pain. So the goal is to create the greatest sum total of pleasure in the universe that you can. Uh, that's the aim of morality, and anything that brings that about is good. Now, Classic objections to utilitarianism are that this um, can lead to sacrificing the one for the good of the many. Uh, now, probably using terminology like that might remind you if you've seen Star Trek II, the search, or is it, yeah. Yes, yeah, Star Trek True is the Wrath of Khan, and I think it's in there that Spock sacrifices himself and says the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Being a good Vulcan, he's a utilitarian. So he's saying, uh, my, my, uh, what happens to me is outweighed by the good to the others. And in fact, utilitarianism, on the face of it, sounds hedonistic because it says the goal is pleasure. And some people uh, interpret hedonism as being selfish, you know, you're, it's, you're after your own pleasure. But utilitarian, while it says pleasure is the goal, or at least Bentham's version says that pleasure is the goal, it certainly doesn't say that it's just your pleasure, it's everybody's. And it may be that you are m morally required, because it's a moral theory, um, to sacrifice yourself for the good of others. So actually, it, it is it requires rather a lot from most people. Famous objections. Uh, this is a short story, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omalas by Ursula Le Guin. Uh, there's also a similar lesson to be had from The Lottery by Shirley Jackson, which is another, they're both short stories, classic short stories. Basically, the idea of uh, those who walk away, the ones who walk away from Omalas is Omalas is this idyllic place where everybody is happy, there's peace, uh, nobody fights. Um, it's, it's like the perfectly balanced society. All the doors are unlocked, everybody's friendly, but it has a dark secret. And the dark secret is the thing that is required for all of this benefit for society is the torturing of a small child and the children don't live long because they're constantly tortured, so every time one dies you have to replace it with a new one. And the parents of the ones that are chosen, they're chosen by a lottery, I think, uh, and the lottery is a similar idea. Uh, in that case it's a village and the village is very nice, but every year they hold a lottery and uh, the person who is chosen in the lottery gets stoned to death by these nice village people. Um, so uh, this is supposed to be an illustration of what utilitarianism implies, that <clears throat> if you live in Omalas, you should be entirely in favor of this torturing this small child to death, because it's just one small child, and the benefits 
vastly outweigh uh, the suffering of one small child because uh, you know there's so many benefits. Everybody else is living a great life. Um, so insofar as this, uh, insofar as we're like the ones who walk away, because there every once in a while somebody finds out about the small child and says, no, I, I can't, I love living here, but it's not worth it. I cannot live with the guilt that a small child is, has to suffer for, I don't know how it works, it's a spell or something, why, why should there be a connection? But there is one. And they say, no, I, I, I got to walk away from this. I, my, I can't dirty my hands by living here. Uh, so that's a criticism of utilitarianism. The, uh, and this is actually um, perfect because this the objection to balancing. And it's a common object. It's basically the key objection to utilitarianism that it allows because it looks at the sum total. It doesn't look at average pleasure. It looks at the sum total of pleasure. This will mean that some people can suffer horribly in this system. And utilitarianism says, eh, it's the sum total that matters. Doesn't matter who has the pleasure, it just matters that there is the most pleasure that there can be. Now, um, so the objection to balancing says you can't do that. You can't require uh, of particular individuals that they suffer greatly just because that's to the benefit of other people. Balancing, you can't ban balance benefits and burdens in that way. Um, so that's the background. Now, Parfit is going to try to argue that his, his new um, views on personal identity take some of the sting away from criticisms like this and therefore make utilitarianism more palatable by undercutting one of the key objections to utilitarianism. Another way to put this, and this is uh, uh, a Rawlsian phrase, Rawls is if Parfit is kind of a giant in British philosophy, well he's a giant in Anglo-American philosophy, um, perhaps of even greater stature is John Rawls who whose great work was uh, published in, the, in like 71, I think, um, called A Theory of Justice. And his, uh, his work is on this topic, distributive justice, as A Theory of Justice, the, the, clue, uh, the clue is in the title. Now, if you think reading Parfit is hard, at least Parfit has tons of juicy examples. Mm, Rawls not so good on examples. It's solid theory and, and uh, I studied Rawls in graduate school and he's definitely a great theorist but it, it's heavy going. However, his theory is uh, justice as fairness. So he says uh, a just society, a society that we would say is well ordered, has to be a fair society and he spells out what this is. And one of the key objections to utilitarianism, of course, embedded in this, is that it's unfair. It's not fair on the poor little um, child that gets tortured to death. That's unfair. So uh, Rawls would very much object to systems that utilitarians would say, no, those, those are great. All right, so that's probably the main topic of this chapter, which touches on the implications of Parfit's reductionism about personal identity on ethics. But before we get there, he runs very quickly through the implications of his view on a number of different areas. You could write an entire book on each of these, and people have. First one, autonomy versus paternalism. So, uh, one of the things that um, particular philosophers argue is most important about a well-lived life is that it be autonomous. We will look at this in more detail later in the course. That is, that you be in control of your own life. Autonomy is very important. 
It's, there's a, a figure who is perhaps most famous for arguing for this, um, and it's the 19th century philosopher John Stuart Mill in a work called On Liberty. And rather strangely, his other major work, of the, uh, which actually came later, is called Utilitarianism. He's the first person to use the term, and he adapts, and in, some people would say improve on, Bentham's theory. So he actually has these two commitments, but most critics of Mill ever since have said, you can't, you got to pick. You can't be in favor of utilitarianism or be in favor of autonomy. Um, he tries to argue that uh, allowing people to be autonomous, allowing people control of their own lives, actually serves utilitarianism better. But uh, most people say, think uh, he's a, you know, there are criticisms of that, but they don't really work. Okay, but autonomy, most people say it's very valuable. Uh, you know, when people say freedom is what we care about, they mean because it allows you control over your life. It, it allows you to be an autonomous individual. What Parfit says is that his, um, his relation R uh, seems to imply that... Um, in the previous chapter, we've seen that we've replaced the idea of imprudence with immorality. So remember the smoking child. Instead of saying to the child, you shouldn't smoke because it'll be bad for you, it'll, you know, you'll be sorry later, at which point the child who has read his perfect says, oh, I won't care because that person, uh, the person who gets lung cancer will be very loosely related to me. They're, they're, you know, relation R doesn't hold very strongly at all. So I don't really care about that person self-interestedly. So instead of trying to appeal to the child's prudence, we would say, wait a minute, that's a person. That, it may not be you, but it's definitely a person in the future, and your behavior has direct effects on that person. Uh, you are, in a, a sense, secondhand smoking for causing that, you are causing that person cancer by your actions. So even if you don't think it's you and don't think you have self-interested reasons, what you're doing is immoral. You are directly giving cancer to that person. Uh, you, you don't think that person is you and maybe it isn't you, but it's a person and you're giving them cancer. You can't do that. So this means that instead of saying, well, it's your life, if we believe that the person in the future, you know, the 60-year-old, was 100% the same person as the child, at some point we have to say, eh, it's your life, live your life. If you want to die of cancer, that's up to you. We can't, it would be immoral to intercede on your behalf uh, because people should be allowed, people should be allowed to be stupid. That's the idea of autonomy. If we respect autonomy, we allow people to screw up their lives because it's their lives and they should have 100% control of them. However, once you start saying that person in the future is not you, then you, autonomy doesn't enter the picture. You don't get to screw up that person's life because it's not you. So that means, uh, Parfit says, we can be more paternalistic. We can say, no, I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to stop you smoking. We're going to prevent you smoking in the same way that you're not allowed to poison your neighbors. You're not allowed to poison that person in the future. So we can be paternalistic, which of course, paternalistic is uh, normally, the idea of paternalism is when you make someone do something for their own good. Um, so actually, it's rather an unfortunate name. Uh, it, it, we aren't really being paternalistic because we don't think that's you. We think that's only partly you. So actually, we're, if we prevent people, children from smoking, we're doing it because in the same way that we prevent them from murdering other people. They're not allowed to harm other people. But that's an implication of his view. And of course, once you dilute the importance of autonomy, already you're diluting the importance of the criticism of the objection to balancing. And we'll see that more clearly. <coughs> Abortion. Um, this is where he talks about the distinction that Locke draws between the human and the person. And the person doesn't even exist until consciousness uh, comes into play. And 
you know, when does a, a growing human become conscious? Certainly not until, certainly not in the first trimester, probably not in the second, maybe not even in the third. Babies don't even form memories very well. A baby doesn't necessarily remember from, uh, you know, five minutes to the next. So there is no person until maybe after the, the child is born. And if persons are the things that count morally, well, that, that, then that implies that abortion might not be wrong because you're not killing the rights bearers. The rights bearers are not the human beings, which come into existence much earlier than the persons do. They're the persons. And if there's no person there, um, then abortion is not murder because murder is killing a person. It's not just killing a human. And he also talks about end of life. If, for example, we, we already think that if somebody is brain dead, well, they're still alive, bodily, they're alive. So if, you're a, if you believe in the physical criterion of personal identity, you say, that's me. That, that person whose brain is liquefied and is being kept, aside, kept alive by a machine, that's me. Whereas if you believe in relation, uh, no, that's not you and that's not even a person because persons have to have, be able to be conscious and that is no longer conscious. Yes, it's a human being, but it's not wrong to kill it. So that's why Parfit talks about both ends of life. Human beings, uh, our existence as a human being extends beyond our existence as a person in both directions. Human beings start earlier and end later, particularly if we become brain dead or get severe Alzheimer's. Um, punishment, yes. Uh, Locke again brings this up. Locke says, uh, is it, should we punish a man sober for what he did drunk? Well, to recall my, um, to recall my uh, uh, accident punting when I, was a, um, when I was an undergraduate, which I don't remember, was it me who puked? Suppose there's a law in Oxford about puking off punts, um, which are these flat bottom boats. I, I've come to know that not everybody knows what a punt is. Is it, um, uh, should I be punished now? Suppose it's discovered now that there's this uh, severe penalty of, for, against puking off punts. Should I be punished for it? Well, um, Locke said, no, not at all, because it wasn't me, because there's no, I have no connection to, I have no direct connection of, of memory to that person, because I have no memory of that. So Locke already suggested that desert, which includes punishment and praise, uh, is connected to whether or not you remember, whether or not you're the same person. And Remember, Parfit, Parfit's innovation is to say that connection is not 100%. It, uh, my connection to me in a, in a minute is probably 100%. My collection, connection to me in uh, a year is already less than 100%. My connection to me in 10 years may be much less than 100%. So um, suppose I commit a crime and then I'm only... He says, imagine a, one of the few deserving... Uh, Nobel Peace Prize winners, because some, some people have won the Nobel Peace Prize who are pretty shady individuals. But I suppose you're one of the deserving ones. And then it's discovered that at age 90, it's discovered that you, you got in a fight and injured someone when you were 20 and you were never caught. Should you be punished for that? And he says, absolutely not, because there's a very little connection. I mean, even if you remember doing that, you're not the same person because your personality has completely changed. Obviously, that person, that person was a hothead. Um, you're a Nobel Peace Prize who has worked for the past decades and decades only for, for the good of humankind. So punishment should be in degrees. Now, uh, a lot of critics of Parfit seize on this and say, what? If you don't get caught, you get away with it just because you're not the same person. But, you know, you're the one who did that and you were never punished. If you'd have been caught then, you would have been punished and deservedly so. Why should you get away just because of luck? And what Parfit would say, 
what Puffett would say in reply is, well, if I died before you caught me, then you would say, well, there's nobody there that can be punished. You wouldn't try and find someone and say, we've got to punish someone, let's just find someone and punish them. You would say, no, there's no one to punish. But that's what I'm saying now. There's no one to punish because I'm not the same person as the person who committed. So it's as if the person who committed the crime has died. And punishing me would be like punishing some stranger. That, that's what he says his view implies. Commitment. Um, so the, the 19th century Russian. He's a young man who will inherit vast wealth in a while, but he holds socialist principle, principles now. He signs a document that will give the wealth away to the peasants, and which could only be revoked by his wife. He then tells his wife to promise him never to revoke the document, even if he begs. If you've seen Young Frankenstein, there's a very funny scene uh, where he says, you know, I'm going in there with the monster. Don't let, don't unlock the door, even if I beg. And, you know, and immediately he says, I was kidding. Um, I, you know, he will beg when the time comes. Because his socialism is essential to him now. And if he ever changes, he won't be the same person. So what the young Russian is saying to his wife, make this commitment to me now. And if me later says break it, then you owe me now not to listen to that person. You're making the commitment to me now, and you don't hold that commitment to me in the future, even though I have the same name and we treat, you know, I'm supposedly the same person. Because if I start saying, no, I want the money, I've reneged on my socialist principles, that's a clear sign that relation R doesn't hold because my personality has changed to such a degree. General claim on 328 that he, uh, about commitment that Parfit says. We may regard some events within a person's life as in certain ways like birth or death. Those would be like personality, extreme personality changes. Not in all ways, for beyond these events the person has earlier or later selves, but it may be only one out of the series of selves which is the object of some of our emotions and to which we apply some of our principles. So in other words, if I suddenly have a, a, have a complete change of heart. Like I had a friend who, um, who, when we were in high school, was firmly committed to extreme socialism. He, uh, he, sold the so he stood on street corners and handed out socialist worker and, and you know, we'd go on and on about it. And then like, we lost touch for a few years and when I found him again, he was a right winger. He completely changed. Um, what would have earlier him have spoke, uh, thought of, uh, uh, of later him. My, my theory of, he, he had kind of a breakdown. He, um, he was like a, a star uh, in high school, uh, it, up to about the age of 16, and you know, was like academically 100% on everything, and then just something happened to him in high school, and he just failed all his exams, and he became bitter and cynical, and he's dead now, because he became an alcoholic. Um, so. Kids, stick to socialism. Um, but, you know, the point at which he changed from socialism to uh, whatever his right-wing views were um, was sort of like the death of, uh, of the earlier him. And so, uh, in the case of the 19th century Russian, uh, Parfit says the wife should refuse, uh, refuse the middle-aged man to uh, change it so that he gets the money. Why? Because she loves not her middle-aged husband, but the young man she married. This is why it is to the young man that she believes she ought to be loyal. All right, so notice what this is indicating is that within an, one life, one, a life of human being, there can be different selves. This is gonna be important for distributive justice. Okay, and in fact, finally, we've got that. So distributive justice um, says that uh, a society shouldn't just care about the sum total of welfare in that society. We should care who gets what. So, um, for example, utilitarianism uh, as Nozick 
who was a contemporary of Rawls, disagreed with Rawls on a lot of things, but both of them hated utilitarianism, knows it would say that uh, utilitarianism is not a historical view. It doesn't look at the past of the individuals. It just says, look at, uh, it's a, he called it a time slice theory. Just look at the state of society right now. Can the, the, the sum total of pleasure in that society be optimized by shuffling around uh, some stuff? Okay, if it can, do it. You, uh, but what you might be doing is making happier some people who did terrible things and uh, you're, you're sacrificing some people who have been tormented in the past by those very people and you're doing an injustice by seeking this goal of greater pleasure. So uh, instead you should look at principles of distributive, well Nozick would not say that, he was opposed to principles of distributive justice too. He, he argued for a libertarian view, uh, but um, Nozick was also notoriously, uh, he would just come up with these amazing ideas, pursue them for just long enough to write a book and then neglect them. So he, he never returned to libertarianism after that. Rawls, on the other hand, worked on theories of distributive justice his entire life and said that what we should care about is fairness. And so principles of, uh, an example of a principle uh, of distributive justice would be one that sought equality. Rawls's principle is not quite this, but he, he says it's a justifiable uh, departure from equality because it's, it's sort of a better version of equality. Um, but, you know, think of the principle of equality. We should treat everybody equally. Obviously, in Omalas, uh, the, the little child is not being treated equally, and this seems to be utilitarianism. Now, what does Parfit say about the principle of equality, principles of distributive justice? He says, hey, I'm all in favor. I'm not, you know, I'm not a hardcore utilitarian. I'm in favor of principles of distributive justice. Um, but uh, what's your objection? Well, it's the objection to balancing. And he says, okay, but what's this based on? And the objection to, he says, obviously, a clear part of the objection to balancing is something uh, called the, um, uh, what does he call it? The, um, about, it's to do with compensation, that we think that you cannot compensate impossible across lives. That is, he says, one of the things that motivates this criticism of utilitarianism is that you think you cannot compensate um, a, the child for the loss that they're receiving. So, what he says, but look, think of the, uh, what the self-interest theory says. The self-interest theory says that you should sacrifice as a youth for the good of you as an adult. You should, instead of playing, you should go to school. Instead of spending all your money, you should save. And that's okay. We're asking the, the, the young you to sacrifice for the good of later you. And that's okay because you can be compensated later on. You are compensated for your sacrifice as a young person by the rewards you get as an old person. So we're totally okay with that. Um, but we object to balancing, or people like Rawls object to uh, the sacrifice because you can't compensate across lives. Uh, Young you can be compensated by the rewards you get as an old person. But, uh, you know, child that suffers in Omalas is not compensated by the rewards to other people. So compensation is not impossible. But what Parfit wants to point out is that actually, if you believe his theory, there is narrower scope for compensation because the, the, the person who sacrifices as a young person, on his view, isn't really 
the person who gets the reward in retirement as an old person. So, in one sense, uh, the objection to balancing is undermined by the fact that there is less scope for, um, for compensation because uh, it is hard to compensate um, a young person because the young person literally only exists while they're young. So now there is such a thing as simultaneous compensation as he says, what's the example? You know, I am compensated for my suffering of icy blast of wind in my face by the beautiful view from the top of the mountain. So you can balance, you know, suffering with, uh, suffering with reward that comes at exactly the same time. That kind of compensation is always going to be possible. But compensation later on is just l not as possible on his view because later you is not the same as you now. So compensation is less possible. Now, um, if what, what does that mean? Does that necessarily mean that uh, therefore it's more okay for um, people to, uh, for, for the child to suffer for the good of the many? Well, no, not obviously. That actually looks like it says it's uh, no suffering is okay. So, um, uh, that's uh, not immediately achieving a support of utilitarianism. And it, it gets worse for utilitarianism because he says, recall what I said in, in the last chapter about how because we can't appeal to prudence in the case of the child smoker, we have to switch to morality. We say you have a moral duty you don't have a duty of self-interest not to smoke um, because we can't say that's you uh, age 60 getting lung cancer. So we can't appeal to prudence, but instead we switch to morality and we say, no, it is morally wrong of you to smoke because you don't have the right to cause cancer to somebody who isn't you and the old person isn't you on, uh, or at least is very, very faintly you. So you switch to morality instead of self-interest. And he says, actually, my view of uh, personal identity means that we have a wider scope for the principles of uh, distributive justice. In other words, if we're going to... Uh, so the principles of justice say everybody should be treated equally. And normally, that allows some sacrifice uh, for people at certain stages of their life so long as they are rewarded later in life. So treating people equally can mean, you know, for ex example, we might say it's okay to conscript s young people into the National Guard and ask them to um, do service to the community if we also provide them with a pension. So uh, it's okay to require people to serve their community if at the end we reward them uh, with the pension. Now, what he's saying is you can no longer do something like that um, just in terms of compensation. Your reason for allowing that can, can't be in terms of compensation. So if you're going to say that, you're going to have to say it's okay to, um, it's okay to require young people to work for the good of old people on kind of utilitarian grounds. It's just good. It's good for society as a whole if the young people sacrifice uh, for old people. There's no possibility of compensation because the young people will never get old. That is because uh, the, the, old people, the old human being that the young human being will become is not the same person as the young person because uh, relation R has degraded. So there is wider scope for the, uh, uh, for the principles of distributive justice they don't just apply, we, sh we shouldn't just treat people fairly, we shouldn't just treat Fre Fred uh, as well as we do Frida. We should, treat, we should also apply the principles of distributive justice across time. Um, so we should treat young Fred 
w as well as we te treat old Fred, and we can't require young Fred to sacrifice for old Fred. Um, so uh, we should take uh, the principles of distributive justice to have a wider scope, which seems to work against utilitarianism, because utilitarianism says it is um, opposed to the principle of equality uh, across lives and within lives. They say, yeah, you can say, we don't have to treat people equally. Our goal is the sum total. We don't, everybody doesn't have to get the same. So saying that, no, actually not only does the principle of uh, equality apply between people, it also applies within lives. That means that the principle has a wider scope which seems to count against utilitarianism. But, as Parfit says, I'm actually going to argue that it should have less weight. Um, that is, that the, um, uh, this is in section 114. He says we should give the principle less weight. I'll just read you the quote. The reductionist view does support a change in the scope, scope of distributive justice. It supports giving these principles more scope. That is now the principle of equality doesn't just apply between people, it applies bet uh, within lives, between old you and young you. So that they apply even within a single life. A reductionist is more likely to regard this child's relation to his adult self as being like a relation to a different person. He is thus more likely to claim that it is unfair to impose burdens on the child merely to benefit the adult self. But, uh, so right then, it looks like this counts against utilitarianism, because utilitarianism requires all kinds of sacrifice between people within lives. But as he says, um, the, the implications of applying these within, uh, within a life are kind of unacceptable, because that means that we wouldn't give kids childhood inoculations. We wouldn't give them inoculations that are for the good of society to prevent outbreaks. Uh, well, but we, not only that, we wouldn't even give them uh, inoculations for their own good later. Because it's not for their own good, and it, it, obviously ch kids don't like getting inoculations. They don't want the inoculations. And if the person who will benefit from the inoculations is not even the same person as them, then uh, if you if you have an objection to balancing, you say, we can't, we can't do that. And, and Parfit says, but that's, that's obviously stupid, right? It's obviously stupid not to inoculate children just because it's not for their own good. So what this tells us is that the objection to balancing is kind of selfish, and we should give it less weight. So that's what he means. So. Once we see that the um, principles of distributive justice not only apply across people, they would have to apply within, pe within people's lives, we see, oh, maybe they're not so good. Maybe it, it, it's not such a good idea to care so much about them. We should give them less weight. Um, compensation doesn't matter as much. Uh, because the only reason for a person to care about being compensated is if, um, is if the non-reductionists are right and old you is exactly the same person uh, to young you. Okay, section 116, um, an argument for giving less weight to equality. Again, he's pushing a, an uh, analogy between persons and nations. This comes up all the time because he's a reductionist. A reduction, we're, we're all reductionists about nations, he says, except certain Hegelian weirdos. A Hegelian weirdo would say, you know, England is something over and above the English people and the English land. It's something that has existence, like one of Plato's forms. He says, nobody buys that. We're all reductionists about nations. We say we talk about England as if it existed separately, but really we think there's nothing more to England than the people and the land that make it up. That's uh, we're reductionists about nations. We should be reductionists about persons. 
We talk as if Simon is this thing that exists through time 100% unchanged, just as England has existed through time 100% unchanged, even though it's been made up of different people. But really, we think all that England is, is the English people and land existing today. That's all it is. Uh, and really, we should think all that Simon is, is the cells and the mental states that exist right now. We do not deny the reality of nations, but we deny that they are separately or independently real. And in that sense, we're reductionists about nations. Their existence just involves the existence of their citizens living together in certain ways on their territories. We may therefore, on this view, think a person's nationality less morally important. On the reductionist view about persons, we hold similar beliefs. We believe the existence of a person to evolve nothing more than the occurrence of interrelated mental and physical events. We do not deny that people exist, and we agree that we are not a series of events, we are not thoughts and actions, but thinkers and agents. But this is true only because we describe our lives by ascribing thoughts and actions to people. Um, as I've argued, we should give a complete description of our lives that was impersonal. So, what he wants to say is that um, you shouldn't think of uh, something being good for England as being divorced from what's good for the English people that make it up right now. And you shouldn't think that, for example, suppose England, England had one of the biggest empires the world has ever known. But suppose a catastrophe hits England, uh, and the England needs help from the rest of the world. Parfit would say, we shouldn't say, oh, England shouldn't have help because they, they, were, they had too much in the past. They you know, took from other nations, which is certainly true, uh, and you know, uh, they've, they've been rich in the past, that's all the good they get. They don't get good now. It would, be, it would be treating the rest of the world unfairly to help them out now because they've already had their good stuff. Parfit would say, no, that's wrong. We shouldn't care that England in the past had good stuff because it's just the English people now and they are suffering. They didn't get the good stuff in the past. And so he says, once you think of, of persons as kind of short-lived things, then what you care about is their suffering right now, and you don't care so much about what happened in the past. You don't care that they were bad in the past, and you say, you were bad in the past, so you don't get good stuff now. Uh, you don't care about that, because they weren't the ones that were bad in the past. Um, so he says, think again about lefty and righty. I remember lefty and righty are the, the two hemispheres. In the, the case, my division, um, what is that, chapter 12, where, uh, uh, you know, if one of them survived, we would say, oh, it's the same person. But because two, both of them survived, we'd say, well, neither of them are the same person. Um, so he says, well, the non-reductionist who says that neither of them are the same person would allow somebody to commit a crime, and then if they split, they, nobody would be guilty. And he says, well, no, if, this, if the split happened immediately after the crime, both of them carry the weight of guilt because there, there is a strong connection. They remember it as happening a few minutes ago. So if anybody should be punished, both of them should be punished. Both of them uh, deserve punishment. Whereas the non-reductionist says nobody should be punished. So his view is actually more um, uh, intuitive, he says there. But once you put everything together, he says really what his view adds up to is a lot like negative utilitarianism, which gives priority to the relief of suffering. It's, uh, so actually, he says, what we should care most about is ensuring that people suffer the least. So notice this wouldn't really allow um, well, yeah, it, it kind of might still allow uh, omelas, but if you care most about relieving suffering rather than increasing pleasure, then you wouldn't allow omelas because you would say, no, sorry, that 
society we're measuring only who suffers and there's a lot of suffering coming from that one small child so we can't do that. Um, there's a lot going on in this chapter. This chapter is enormously important because he ties in why he's been talking about personal identity when really this book is a work in ethics or meta-ethics. Uh, and here's where it all comes together. The implications are massive and they apply to criticisms, uh, to a fundamental criticism of a very major ethical theory. Now, he's not saying he necessarily is a utilitarian. As he says, it, it sounds like what we end up supporting is sort of negative utilitarianism, which is not the same as utilitarianism, even though it's a consequentialist theory. But he wants to show that this apparently knockdown criticism to utilitarianism that people are fond of giving actually relies on this theory of personal identity non-reductionism and which he has said doesn't work. And once you have the right theory of personal identity, then maybe utilitarianism isn't so easily dismissed as it was in the past.